Hello, everyone. This is Murat Yilmaz from the School of Computing, Dublin City University. Uh, today, uh, we'll be working on a complimentary lecture about software architecture. So, as we started progressing on uh, learning uh, about the software architecture, uh, I would like to revisit the quality attributes in this session and uh, give you more, more ideas about how this can be correspond with the business needs. So let's start with the main fact as like we have the business goals and the quality attributes, which some business goals may lead to quality attribute requirements, which lead to the architecture. So what we can say, some business goals uh, may lead to quality attribute requirements. And some of these may lead direct to architectural decisions, these business goals, and some others are really related with the non-architectural solutions. So, so we can have a non-architectural solution here. While what we can have is an architectural solution. which some of that sometimes we could see the business goals coming through that point. Uh, eventually, uh, this is one of the important aspects. So we think sometimes we thought that the software architecture is the center of the universe actually, but it could be understood with the relative four different contexts. So the technical aspects of the software architecture is quite important. What technical role does the software architecture play in the system? which parts, uh, which systems of which part it's part. So this is quite important. Secondly, the project life cycle, which means that how does a software architecture relate to the other phases of the software development life cycle? The business aspect, which means that how does the presence of the software architecture affect the organizational business environment? And professional, which means that what is the role of software architect in an organization or in a development project? So from the technical context, the most important technical context factor is a set of quality attributes that the architecture can help to achieve, achieve. So the architecture's current technical environment is also important factors. So there are standard industrial practices and some techniques which are used in software engineering to, for the, uh, to prevalent in the architecture's professional community. And as we can say, today's uh, the organization uh, of the information systems could be web-based, object-oriented, service-oriented, mobility-aware, cloud-based, or social networking-friendly. Well, it wasn't always so, as you might guess, but it won't be uh, like so many years from now, this could definitely change. So when we say the project life cycle, as you might recall from the previous lectures or previous modules, we have four dominant software processes. Uh, accordingly, we can say the waterfall, iterative, agile, and model-driven development could be the main four factors. Uh, so software developments are standard approaches for developing or engineering a software product. They impose a discipline on software engineering and more important, teams of software engineers. They tell the members of team what to do next and what, what are the dominant factors as we already mentioned the names. So there would be several architectural activities uh, uh, agnostic from the software development process. So we could have architectural activities which should be not directly uh, referring to our uh, development process. Using that architecture to realize a complete design and implementing or managing the evaluation of the target systems or applications are essential at that point. So first, what we do is to making a business case for the system. So making a business case. So understanding the architecturally significant requirements. So understanding the architecturally significant requirements. And thirdly, creating or selecting the architecture. Uh, 
document and communicating the architecture. So documenting. and communicating the architecture. Analyzing or evaluating the architecture is the fifth. Analyzing or evaluating the architecture. The sixth will be implementing and testing the system based on the architecture. And the seventh one would be ensuring that the implementation conforms to the architecture. So these are the seven uh, uh, bullets that we need to consider when we try to formalize our architecture. So architecture in the development organization ultimately wants to make a profit. It would uh, the organization uh, would like to capture the market or dominate the market as uh, quickly as possible. They should have to be stay in the business uh, and keep their customers uh, guided, guide, uh, guided and do their jobs better and uh, keep the staff gainfully employed, make their uh, stockholders happy and a bit of uh, each of them should have to be uh, satisfied in order to have the architecture and business goals to correspond uh, in a perfect manner. Customers have their own goals for acquiring a system, usually involving some aspects of making their life easier or more productive. So other organizations involved in the project life cycle could be subcontractors or government regulatory agencies, which could have their own goals or agendas dealing with the system. Therefore, the architects need to understand who the vested organizations are, what are their goals, and these goals will help to profound influence on the architecture. So when we think about every quality attribute should originate from some higher purpose that can be described in terms of an added value. So any quality attribute should be correspond with a value added, an added value. So like, for example, user visible response time, platform flexibility, ironclad security or any dozens of other needs should have to be embedded in these quality attributes. So we, we can come up with the question, why do you want the system to have a real fast response time? This would differentiate the product from its competitors, perhaps let the developer or the organization capture the market share. So that could be one of the important aspects. So some business goals will not show up in form of the requirements. Still, other business goals have no effect on the architecture, on the other hand. A business goal to lower costs might realize by asking employees to work from home, turn on office thermostats down in the winter, or using less paper in the printers. Uh, so these are could be business goals, but they are not really affecting the architecture in that manner. So architects need more than just the technical skills. Architects needs to explain to one stakeholder or another to choose priorities from different properties. And while particular stakeholders are not having their, uh, having all of their exceptions fulfilled, expectations fulfilled, architects need be, to be diplomatic, uh, doing negotiations and uh, have communication skills. Architects needs to be able to communicate ideas clearly. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, architects need to have uh, the skills of proper writing in technical form. And you need to manage a diverse workload to be able to switch between the context frequently. And you will need some other leaders to develop or managers. And architects should need to have up-to-date knowledge. You, an architect will need to know about, for example, patterns, database platforms, or web service standards, 
and you will need to know the business concentrations as well. So there would be several different uh, demands from the stakeholders, such as developing organizations, management stakeholders come up with the low cost, keeping the people employed. So marketing stakeholders come up with new features, short time to market, low cost, partially with competing products. And the user stakeholders might come up with like behavior, performance, security, reliability, and usability demands. Maintenance organization would ultimately come up with modifiability uh, to keep themselves uh, more uh, productive during the development. Uh, customer stakeholders will come up with low cost, timely delivery, not change uh, very often, perhaps. So what is a stakeholder actually? So a stakeholder is someone who has a stake in the success of the system. They would have different specific concerns uh, uh, that they wish to the system to guarantee or optimize. So they know and understand the nature, source and priority of the constraints on the project as early as possible. Otherwise, uh, there would be more conflicts. Uh, and they should be able to identify and actively engage uh, to the solicit needs and expectations, which should have to be identified and uh, stakeholders should have to be negotiated on the top of these priorities. Early engagement of stakeholders allows you to understand the constraints of the tasks, manage expectations, negotiate over the priorities, and therefore you could be able to make trade-offs as the software architect. And communication among the stakeholders, usually uh, like the software architecture represents a common abstraction of the system that most of the system stakeholders can use for creating a mutual understanding. That's one of the reasons we create the software architecture. Negotiating uh, on several things based on the quality attributes. Uh, and uh, therefore, perhaps we could be able to form a consensus over the things that has more value uh, to uh, based on the requirements. Uh, and then stakeholders could be able to understand the importance with the other stakeholders' uh, viewpoints. Communicating with each other. So it's a kind of a tool and a mechanism that could be helpful to communicate. So, well, stakeholders of the system could be like a customer, a user perhaps, a project manager, and coder or a tester. So they all concern with different characteristics. So the architecture, or at least parts of it's sufficiently abstract from most non-technical people that can understand it adequately, hopefully at that regard. So the user will concern that the system is fast, reliable and available when needed. Customer is concerned with the architecture can be implemented on the schedule according to the budget. Manager would be worried about the architecture with allow teams to work largely independently, interacting in disciplined and controlled ways. The architect probably be worried about the strategies to achieve all of these goals. Architecture provides a common language in which different concerns can be expressed, negotiated, resolved at a level that is intellectually manageable for even large and complex systems. So that's the main goal actually for our, the architect to uh, do this effort to uh, help people to be as a, uh, using it as a tool. So what are the earliest design decisions which the architecture could affect it from? So there would be several things like, will the system run on one processor or distributed? Like one CPU or distributed? So will software be layered? There would be layered, logical layer, database layers, or the other layers. Will the components communicate synchronously or asynchronously? Will they interact by transferring control or data or both? Will the system depend on specific features of the operating system or the hardware? Will the information that flows through the system be encrypted or not? 
So what communication protocols we will choose? So this could be a nightmare of having chance of every kind of different design decisions. These decisions should take under uh, consideration with the architect and the software quality team, depending on the company and organization structures. So we define constraints on implementation. And implementation exhibits an architecture if it conforms to the design decisions prescribed by the architecture. The implementation must be implemented as the set of prescribed elements interacting with each other, fulfill its responsibility to the other elements as dictated by the architecture. Each of these prescriptions is constrained uh, on the implementer. So element builders may not be aware of the architectural trade-off. So the architecture or the architect simply constrains them in a, such a way to meet the trade-off. So the goal is to meet the trade-offs. So an architect assign performance budget to the pieces of a software involved in larger pieces of functionality. If each software unit stays within its budget, the overall transaction will meet its performance requirements. So that is one of the things uh, you're looking from a different viewpoint as an architect. So the architecture prescribes the structure of the system being developed. The architecture is typically used as the basis for, uh, for the work breakdown structure. The work breakdown structure in turn could be able to dictate the units of planning, scheduling, budgeting, inter-team communication along the channels, configuration control and file system organization, integration and test plan procedures. So at, uh, what we're looking for is transferable and reusable model. So that's one of our, uh, that's an inheritance of things that we do in software business. So we are looking for transferable and reusable model or components. A software product line or a family is a set of software systems that are built using the same set of reusable assets. Chief among these assets is the architecture that was designed to handle the needs of the entire family. The architecture defines what is fixed for all members of the product line and what is variable. The architecture for a product line becomes a capital investment by the organization. So, well, what, what we can use uh, independently developed components as well. Commercial off-the-shelf components, open source software, publicly available applications, and network services are example of interchangeable software components. So there would be several components that could be interchangeable. So this can help us to decrease time to market, increase reliability as if this component is widely used by uh, other uh, companies or just populated with many comments of the previous uh, users or stakeholders uh, could be lower than the cost of designing something from the beginning and ultimately flexibility as well. So this payoffs can be paid on that regard. So basis for training of an architecture as the first introduction to system for a new project members as well. So if you think about an architecture, it's quite important for new members. So model views could be excellent for showing someone the structure of the project. So model view. And component connector views are excellent for explaining how those systems ex expected to work and accomplish its job. So component explaining how the system accomplish its job. So 
let's recap uh, to this point. So what we can say is the architecture exists in four different contexts. It's technical. We have one technical. Project life cycle. Business and professional. So technical context includes the achievement of quality attribute requirements. Project life cycle, regardless of the software development methodologies you use, you must perform specific activities. And in the uh, business viewpoint, the system created from the architecture must satisfy the business goals of the wide variety of the stakeholders. Professionally speaking, we must have certain skills and knowledge to be an architect and there are certain duties that must perform as an architect. The architecture has influence that leads to its creation and its existence has an impact on the architect and the organization and potentially the industry. So we call this the cycle, the architectural influence cycle. Architectural in influence cycle. So this cycle have the architect, the architect has the architecture at hand, an architecture transform into the system functions. And we have the stakeholders that can be connected here from the business perspective, technical perspective, and the project perspective. And there will be other professionals that can influence uh, the architects from the professional perspective as well. So this is quite important in, in terms of understanding the influence cycle of the architect. And like, let's take a look at the quality attributes at our hands. Standard list of quality attributes. So functional suitability, we can start with functional suitability and performance efficiency. Compatibility, usability. usability, reliability, security, maintainability, and finally portability. And there are sub characteristics that these uh, quality attributes could have. Like, for example, let's consider the functional stability. Which have functional completeness. Functional correctness. and functional appropriateness. And if you look at to the performance and efficiency, We can see time behavior, resource utilization, and capacity.
Well, the compatibility would have coexistence and interoperability. Well, usability would have appropriateness, recognizability, learnability. Operability. User error prediction. User interface aesthetics. And as a sixth of them as the accessibility. And we go through, through the reliability Uh, which needs to have the maturity, availability, uh, the fault tolerance, recoverability, And we go further for the security. Confidentiality. Integrity. non repudiation Accountability. And authenticity. And further, uh, we have two more. Uh, one is the, the maintainability. which has the modularity, reusability, analyzability, modifiability, and testability. And finally, we have the portability attribute, which has adaptability, installability, And finally, replaceability. You might see this list might change. Uh, this was ISO IAC uh, FCD uh, 25010 product quality standard. 
and it has been improved. If you cannot see something that you know about portability in the portability attributes, that's all right, all right, that's fine. So these are the things that we figure out, single out, uh, in order to correspond with the quality attributes. And thank you for listening.